Hey guys, before we start this week's episode, I want to give a quick Patreon shout out to thedrumdirectory.com. The Drum Directory is a free resource for drummers to find and connect with local shops, drum slash cymbal builders, podcasts, etc. And it's a resource for business owners to showcase their brand in relevant categories and interview articles. So check out the website, thedrumdirectory.com and sign up for the email newsletter to get all kinds of cool information. If you'd like to get a shout out on an episode of Drum History, go to patreon.com slash drum history podcast and you can check out the tiers. And at the top level, which is 15 bucks a month, you get a shout out on an episode just like this. So thanks to thedrumdirectory.com and uh, Jake, really appreciate it, man. So now onto the episode with Jeff Kirsch. Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we are joined back on by Mr. Jeff Kirsch. Jeff, welcome on the podcast. Oh, great to be here. Yeah, man. It's good to have you back. Your episode, which was episode 117, your first episode, I should say, was a look at bearing edges. And um, there's certain shows that like people will message me and say, oh, I loved that particular episode. Like, and, and your, that one in general was very, very uh, popular, which I knew it would do well and people would like it, but it, it really resonated with people. Um, so, so I recommend people check that one out um, as well. But Jeff is back on today. I'll set it up and then I'll let you take it away, my friend. But uh, Jeff came up with a great idea, which I think is fascinating and very... A uh, very important conversation of basically why do drum brands sound different? I mean, they're they're all round cylinders that you hit <laughs> with a stick, <laughs> but obviously there's and you mentioned in our original message Ludwig, Gretsch, Rogers, Camco. I know we've got some Yamaha pictures we'll have here for folks watching on YouTube of what makes them all different. So, on that note, Jeff, take it away and start wherever you want, man, and let's let's dive in. Well, I guess it kind of starts with the birth of the drum set because we've been playing drums for, you know, thousands of years. But generally speaking, those those drums have been um, kind of in one place. And they were made from uh, hollowed out logs. And then as that kind of advanced, well, also clay, metal, um, a lot of different materials were used to support an animal hide head. And that basically meant that um, as the drum evolved into the drum kit, we went from thick, heavy uh, materials to something that could be portable, more lightweight and uh, more adaptable. And yeah. so the first construction you're looking at hollowed out log or staves the first wood construction and staves are like a wine barrel there are strips of wood that are um glued or strapped or tied together and um both of these things are heavy if you've ever carried a djembe in a parade like that's not a light drum no and so la later on you know when when we start to get into the birth of the drum set that was kind of built from everyone's history with drums. You had Chinese tom-toms with um, marching bass drum, maybe from the Civil War. And, sure. um, you know, toms made in, in Germany by a drum smith who was steam bending drum shells. And when the drum set took off, they kind of needed to make these things lighter and easier to produce in bulk. And that's really where the priority was. There, there really wasn't a lot of situations where companies were advertising, oh, this maple shell resonates more and the Luan shell is mellower and warmer. <laughs> Th yeah. This stuff, there was never any conversation of that. Um, even going back through old vintage catalogs and stuff, you, it's it really wasn't a thing. the The thing was, how do we make these light, and how do we make them not? Um, an animal hide head will shrink in the sun. 
and in yeah. the heat with enough force to crush a drum. And um, I'm sure you've probably seen an old old drums just crushed in from uh, the animal hide heads. So they needed to make them light, but they also needed to make them strong, particularly in that um, emergency situation. Of So what would happen is the first drums that we know of as modern would be like a Ludwig or Slingerland, Leedy Ludwig, Slingerland. And that, that shell design actually goes back to the Civil War. And what they were using is poplar, which is a, a soft wood uh, that bends pretty much without steaming it. You can bend that yeah. into uh, a drum shell. And they would wrap that around a set of steam-bent maple rings, which hmm. are incredibly strong. And so what the rings would do is is take the what-if scenario of the head shrinking in the sun. Sure. And, and so, again, with rings, it was never like, oh, we add these rings for tone and resonance and definition. There was... No, None of it was insurance to make sure the drum didn't just absolutely get crushed by the tension of the head. And I, I remember there was early advertising that would talk about the ring being, you know, like, like just keep your drum round or something like that, <laughs> yeah. you know, to keep it from getting out of, out of round. Yeah, it, it was all very uh, utilitarian. It, it wasn't really like a thing about tonal construction. Yeah. And that, that kind of comes along later. But in, um, in some of the photos, uh, that first batch. Jeff shared some photos with me, which we're going to look at. And we will do our best as well to describe them for people who are just listening in the car or whatever. Um, but all right, so explain what we're looking at here. This, this is how most drums were constructed for a couple of hundred years. Most marching drums... Um, this inner core, the darker wood is poplar, uh, Luan, they, they use various things. Um, and it bent really easy. It was lightweight. Um, and it worked great for having drums you can carry around. And mm. the way that they made these shells round, they overlapped the edges of the wood, they overlapped in a scarf joint. And is that for strength or for just like, what would be the main reason of doing that? Well, really just to keep the, the two ends together, uh, gotcha. because a, a straight seam would require some sort of, uh, bracing or structure. And this just made it easier to just overlap the two ends of the shell together in a circle. And they mm. would they would glue this up, and um, now poplar is not a pretty wood to look at. So what they would do, and it's also not necessarily the best against uh, moisture and wear. So what they would do is they would cover the inside and outside plies with a maple or a mahogany. And so gotcha. when they wrapped the shell together, they wrapped all three plies around all three plies uh creating that hump basically in the hmm. shell compared to the rest of the thickness which is only three plies here in the center you have almost six when you're tuning an animal hide head this is this is not a problem you, you can tune a triangle shaped drum a square drum uh none of that stuff matters with animal hide but as soon as you precision mold plastic this is kind of a problem, and we, we talked about that a little bit in the Bearing Edge sure. episode, but this was something that drum companies really wanted to get, uh, to get rid of um, when, hmm. when heads went plastic. Which was like 50s, mid, late, mid to late 50s, like 57 or something like that, which... And then there's the whole like pre-international sizes type thing and all that, which I guess was a whole nother like quarter inch sizes and things like that, which uh, that definitely seemed to have, have gone away. But I, I think we've mentioned it before, but I didn't realize that poplar went 
so far back, but I guess it is used a lot of times as that inner inner core uh, ply of a lot of drum brands, but it gets kind of a bad reputation as being a cheap stencil drums or whatever kind of... uh, And and that's an interesting point because to me, um, it is a cheaper wood, but ultimately that's just a bonus. It's kind of funny that this wood is sought after if if the shell says Ludwig on it, you know, or it's... um, it's uh, put down if it if it says made in China on it, but ultimately you can get into the 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 nuances of different woods. But really, in in my book, there's two kinds of wood: there's hardwoods and softwoods. And yeah, the hardwoods will resonate. They'll project. They'll um, they'll carry out whatever your drum head is doing, and they'll amplify it. Um which in some cases could be a really bad thing. If you're not good at tuning or, you know, you have a drum with a particular issue that is going to amplify that issue where softwood drums absorb, they become almost like, you know, the plastic rings that you put on a drum head to kill your overtones. The, the shell itself can become that. And so, when you have that warm, thumpy Ludwig sound, uh, you wouldn't get that from an all maple Ludwig. It would be very resonant and very, very loud. Ludwigs do what they do because they have soft wood in them. The slinger lens. Um, there weren't a lot of other brands at the time. There was Leedy pre Ludwig. Um, but it really wasn't until the, 60s that you start getting like full-on hardwood drums early gretches but even those had a, you know like a poplar or a luon yeah which has a con i mean it's like the hardwoods have a connotation of being i guess more expensive but that doesn't always mean better i guess it's it is what it is for what you're looking for out of your drums because i love the the mij kind of cheaper kits uh and i like oh, the fantastic. vintage drums that have you know the poplar stuff in them but um but i think where that comes from is is like the warmth and um the you know the shell is resonating but it isn't resonating like a maple like yeah, if you took true. your maple custom absolute to a jam with an upright bass and a fiddle um, you're going to destroy those people. Like they're yeah, going to be begging you, you to play lighter. <laughs> In your earlier comment about the the MIJs, that's really a big Ludwig is a big part of what happened there. Um, the Ludwig Slingerland style. This this we'll we'll call it the three ply construction. That's pretty much what it's known as. And they would wrap these three plies uh, uh, ends around each other and create Mm -hmm. this overlap. Um, And this really wasn't a problem in the, in the animal hide head days, but it it did become a problem with plastic heads because once you've got something precision molded, it really needs to sit on something precision or this uh, hump area, this overlap area will tune up before the rest of the head will. Gotcha. And it really is a hump because it's where all of the woods, the, the plies sort of cross over each other and it makes for like a little bit of a, a little bit of a bump out and yeah. messes with the roundness. So I, yeah, I see that. It bumps out on the outside and bumps in on the inside. So you have double the thickness of the rest of the shell. And if you yeah. go back to old ladies, and this is something that, that I used to think was people customizing them. But I go back to the old ladies and the beginning of uh, the early 60s when they started putting the paint on the inside. What I noticed is, is that hump would be filed on, like hand filed and flushed really? into the rest of the bearing edge. So as huh. far as the head knew, that hump wasn't there. And gotcha. And then they would also file the hump out of the inside where the overlap sits in the bearing edge. And the white paint would go on and you can see the filing marks under the white paint. And I've 
you know, millions of drums I've been working on. Like I've, I've seen it uh, many, many times where underneath that old white paint, you can see where the corner of the inside was filed out. And uh, I realized that that's something they did stock that from the factory, they would file the humps out and flush that area into the rest of the drum. And that's Leedy, you said. Yeah, the early early days of uh, when it became Ludwig later, the the Leedy Leedy and Leedy Ludwigs, and yeah. um, and 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 so what what happened is is by by flushing that in, you've, you're basically making the drum kind of perfect. And I think when rock and roll hit, you had basically these two companies um, producing the most. Uh, drums and and suddenly they went from yeah. building drums for a few artists here or there or marching marching drums for schools and that's where the duco comes from the the colors were to you would get them in your school colors oh that's interesting where where to explain maybe people who don't know the duco is where it's like blue on the top blue on the bottom and then there's a band of like uh silver that kind of blends into it almost like a not a sunburst, but you know what I mean. It kind of blends into the color in the middle. Um, but that's from school he, colors. They were orderable in the colors of your school. That uh, makes perfect sense. And 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 so that's why you'll see all different kinds, like uh, you know, yellow and red, and gold and black, and gold and blue, and blue and silver, and black and silver. Hmm. They they. Um, not a lot of them got made. Obviously, they had standard colors that they mostly sold those in to not schools. But that yeah, w- blue and silver seems like a popular one that you see a lot. And, yeah, um, I love yeah. the look of those things. I do too. But anyway, that goes that that's going back to to the popularity of drums and how uh, rock and roll kind of democratized the drum set. Because well, it it pops into my mind as being kind of like the industrial revolution of drumming, mm-hmm. where like it has to get so much more mainstreamed, and they have to. There's more drummers out there. The technology got better. Oh my god, the hardware, <laughs> the hardware. The but it was like wartime kind of. So mm-hmm. then, then across the board, then like tooling got better, and more money was pumped into everything. And, so and then um, it went overseas. Sure. A lot of it. And so so what you had was Ludwig and Slingerland making this very mellow uh, kind of drum set, mellow tone, warm, thumpy. Uh, you know, no one was muffling heads. You know, it really wasn't as necessary back then with the animal hide. Um, what year? Give us, a, give us a date that we're talking about right now with Ludwig and Slingerland using this overlapping technique at that point uh since their birth so birth to to 70 50? oh 70 wow okay that and and that's and that's kind of the problem um that ludwig and, and slingerland both had was you know those machines from what i understand were you know ran for a hundred years they were they were um this shell construction, like I said, goes back to the Civil War, and and so the reason that um, I think they had invested into this equipment, the equipment was making drums, the drums were selling. You know, Ludwig's probably the most selling on Earth at the time. Is it fair to say then that those early Ludwig's and Slingerlands, again going back to the topic of what makes drum brands sound different, did those early Ludwigs and Slingerlands sound pretty close, pretty similar in your opinion. I mean, are they constructed the same? Like what, what does make those different then? Uh, well, really there, there's fundamentally nothing different between a forties, fifties Ludwig and a sixties, seventies Ludwig. There's fundamentally no difference other than they did, slight changes in the manufacturing to kind of either speed things up, most likely to speed things up. That's what they kind of seem like. But like an example yeah. is that filing 
of the hump hand filed an artisan did that uh that's gone by like 65 there, for obvious reasons yeah I mean, they just didn't have the time they were yeah. making millions of these things and and um and so that's one of the things that changed so w- if you get a levy ludwig it's going to be easier to tune sure um it'll still sound the sound is still going to be the same um, but the leady will be a lot more fun to own because it'll it'll tune easier. But the what I'm getting at though really is between Ludwig and Slingerland, if they're using the same, I guess they would have. Had they, did they have a different shell makeup, like construction of plies and? Oh no, those two were identical. Actually, the okay, so yeah, f- first couple of years working on them, I I had a theory that they were all coming out of the the same factory that like Slingerland was buying shells from Ludwig. Like the, the construction is identical. And then, you know, over time I learned, well, that's cause it goes back to the founding of America. Like it goes way back. Uh, that construction sure. is hundreds of years old. And so, um, or at least 150. And then there you see in that picture, that's from looking down on the bearing edge. And where it's black there in the bearing edge, that's an opening. That's an actual gap. And mm. and this is the same Ludwig shell. Yeah, Ludwig yeah. Slingerland. Both of them. Both of them. Um, and that's why I, I really like to talk about these is because that was something they needed to solve. They would fill it with um, chunks of wood, strips of ply extra piece of maple ply or mahogany ply. Um, Most of the time that's, that's how they did that. Uh, But that, that is when you bought a Ludwig in 65, that wasn't there. That was glued together and the shell was resonant. And, you know, a lot of folks will say, Oh, I want that Ringo sound. And, and I always joke that, you know, Ringo's drums were brand new. He wasn't playing an aged Ludwig. Sure. Which is, you know, all we get to play. So what I recommend people do is get get that get that stuff fixed. It 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 will only get worse and work its way around the entire drum until that ring just falls out. And and hmm. and then you get to hear what Ringo heard when he bought his drum set. Because his were uh, not coming apart, and and literally every Ludwig and Slingerland, or um, it seemed like it happens less the farther back you go. Like I'm not sure if people just had more time and and had more focus on the quality of the glues and how they were overlapping it. But um, this really starts to happen in mid '60s drums, all the way into the late seventies, early eighties. Gotcha. And the splitting of the shell. So that's splitting from the ring is splitting from the shell then. Yeah. Correct. Cause that's, and then that, that affects the resonance because there's this open gap there and it's just not quite right. Yeah. They'll, they'll actually vibrate against each other and become a sink, a vibration sink. They'll actually just deaden a note. Um, mm more than uh, you know ludwig shouldn't be dead it should be warm and thumpy but not not dead um but that's that's a pretty big factor in it and so the industry i think was really trying to get away from this yeah you could show that third picture from the side view that is the same shell and you can see that poplar ply now uh, one of the interesting things about the poplar is it's running uh, the grain is running up and down and yeah. the plies around it are going side to side and that poplar expands and contracts with humidity. Plus people were wetting animal hide heads. They were getting these sure. things wet. And so, and stretching them to, because it's skin. Yeah. Yeah. And, and some of that would get into these plies and in between the ring and that's that's part of why a lot of these can be separating also but 
So I think they were really trying to get away from uh, this kind of construction. And that's where yeah. those MIJs come in. Uh, well, th- technically, I would say that's where Gretsch and Rogers come in uh, with using shells made by a company called Jasper. Yeah, I, I need to do a history of Jasper. I, I've heard things, and I know they're like uh, I'm. I'm by no means an expert on it at all, but I've I've heard many different things about Jasper being providing shells for tons of companies mm-hmm. back in the day. So uh, that one will definitely happen at some point. Oh, that would that would be awesome. I'm. I, it's they're my favorite shells. Um, I'm actually right over my shoulder is my Rogers kit here with. Oh, cool. Jasper shelled kit. Now, those shells were kind of flawed um, in a visual way, um, which is why you it's very rare to see an unwrapped Gretsch or an unwrapped Rogers. And also I've never why... never thought about that. Wow. Yeah, it's also why they painted the insides. They were, they were hiding a visual flaw um, because I, I believe essentially like veneers weren't being produced in the mass that kind of happened as plywood kicked in in the 60s 50s and 60s and and so what these company what jasper would use is um say you're building a drum that's 16 inches deep they would use four four inch strips to make one ply one outer ply inner ply huh and so these strips were, were, you know, it obviously doesn't look cool, but it made the whole thing, um, it made it possible for them to make a laminated drum shell. So instead of just a bent piece of wood with something pretty on the outside, this was made like a skateboard, you know, indestructible, yes. um, Easily reproduced, perfectly round cylinders, and um, gotcha. it, it, I think it took a while for for that to happen. But Jasper was really the innovator of that, and that allowed them to ditch the rings altogether. Does anyone use reinforcement rings today? Does that still? I feel like I've seen it on more modern drums sometimes, but it has to be more of like a tonal thing or an aesthetic. Yeah, um, it, it is an aesthetic thing for the most part. Um, I've actually got some, I sent you another batch of photos. Yeah. Okay. So that, that there, that one there is Jasper shell and that's okay. uh, Camco and Camco. I see. They kept the rings. Um, you've now got applied shell and there is no longer an overlap. So you can make these things perfectly round and very, very, very strong. Um, they were using combinations of maple and birch and gum wood. And um, you can see the, the edge profile is rounded. They rounded the inside edge uh, before they put the rings in, just, just for cosmetics, just because it looks cool. It's beautiful. I mean, really, it does look like a skateboard, like you said, with all those plies that you see kind of from the side of a skateboard. But like to see a cutaway of a drum like this is amazing because it, it almost looks instead of like, like a lot of times the rings are like, they look like they're just kind of hammered into place and then glued. This looks like it was built. It just like, it was just built with it. The plies were built into that shape. It's it's really cool looking. Yeah, they they actually hammered those in. Um, I st- it looks perfect. I still use that technique today. The 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 Jasper technique, which then became uh, Keller, would do it the same way. Um, at a Anderson International was Keller's distributor in Los Angeles, and they did. Um, all of DW's early shell work. So the 80s DW's and into the early 90s were actually the shell and the rings were installed at Anderson International. And then DW gotcha. would do the edges and the drilling and the finish. Um, and that really, that was a, 
that was a pretty big deal. So the one after this one, yeah, this is Rogers, also a Jasper shell. Um, instead of rounding the inside and the outside, they just rounded the outside. And what they were trying to do here is, remember how I said the end of the shell can behave like one of those plastic zero rings? Mm-hmm. So by to help dampen things down, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and absorb as it hit as the vibration hits the edge, it'll absorb the the higher overtones, and and so because the higher overtones are actually coming from the outside part of the drum head, hmm. from the edge to the hoop is the same as like from nut to to. Um, to tuners on a guitar neck you can go bling 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 and re- ring that side yes that's yes. the outside of the drum head is a very similar thing it's doing the same thing and it's not in tune and it's really high pitched and that's usually what's bothering people and so the zero ring is kind of stopping it before it gets out there that's super this the very tucked end the very edge of the drum head basically yeah. right that's why timpanies to get more overtone a timpani will run three inches of extra head outside the drum itself um because that wow. part is also resonating yeah the reason ludwigs are so warm is because they were using a very wide patch and when you were asking about the difference between ludwig and slingerland is Ludwig was the first to kind of cut a degree, like a 30 degree and then 45 degree, so that the playing surface of the head instead of the outside surface, uh, the playing surface could could resonate more fully, where Slingerland kept it round on the inside as well. So you're zero ringing the outside and the inside drum head, and it's really thumpy and really warm. Yeah. And and so the main difference between Ludwig and Slingerland is really just the bearing edge um construction wise are incredibly similar. So Slingerland and it looked like Camco more rounded but Ludwig and then it looks like I think you said this one I'm looking at right now is Rogers yeah. on a Jasper shell seems like it has a little bit more of a bearing edge and it's not rounded over. So yeah, it's rounded on the outside to control that outside head overtone, yeah. but it's sharp on the inside to give you this full, as much volume Got it. as you can get. And Camco kind of stuck to the round thing, which was, but it's when you put that zero ring on a softwood drum, it behaves differently than if you put that ring on a hardwood drum. Because like we were yeah. talking about, the hardwood can project. So Camco's gotcha. big round shape like that, but but going into hardwoods made a really woody, warm sound. Jazz guys love it. Um, and that's really the sound that DW bought. Well, and it seems like there's a lot of factors of designing the perfect thing of like the the bearing edge you choose, but also mixed with the arrangement of plies, mm-hmm. right? And the number of plies. Uh, to create that sound for each different brand. But while we're going here, let me ask you the question of like, did brands back then typically modify their shell construction at all? Like one year to the next? Because as far as I understand, like Ludwig was like, you buy one drum over that whole, like you said, that whole period of time, you're basically getting the same drum shell across the board um did any of the brands say no now we're doing a completely different shell design kind of like which i think that happens more today like more modern things are like different bearing edge new series Mm -hmm. it's more we added some babinga now it's gonna be better (laughs) (laughs) now it's three thousand (laughs) dollars more (laughs) no there there were some major shifts uh like when uh for example I mean, Ludwig and Slingerland rode that shell till 79 or somewhere around there. And Ludwig finally said, okay, we can ditch the rings. They're not doing anything and they cost money and and we need to get rid of the overlap hump. And Slingerland didn't survive. Um, yeah. And so 
really it was and i think all of this is driven by rock and roll <laughs> all of this is driven by volume uh, because mass production was driven by rock and roll for sure um, if rock had never totally. happened, there still wouldn't be millions of jazz bands all over the place. Like rock really changed the the drum set and and brought it to the forefront as far as like needing to be produced for every basement and nightclub on the planet. And so they had to basically like figure out how to make make them faster, but also make them better because at the same time you have you know famously. Uh, the Beatles not being able to play concerts anymore because they couldn't hear themselves. And, you know, the PA systems and the amplifiers got loud a lot faster than the drums did. And uh, so when, when, um, when rock and roll hits, uh, like when high volume hits, 70s, 80s, you know, you've got huge PA systems and, you know, John Bonham, couldn't hear himself with his green Ludwigs on stage, so he got an acrylic. Yeah, you don't really think about that when you listen to those bands or you see the cool big old, you know, Alex Van Halen drum sets. A lot of it's like, oh yeah, they needed to do that, you know? Yeah, they, it, it was hard to get a drum set to compete, um, particularly just in the rehearsal space, let alone on stage. And, and Sure. And so you started getting, like, let's go back to the MIJs. Um, they were using Luan and Poplar, but they were copying Rogers and Gretsch. So they were using softer woods, but they were no overlap humps and uh, a little bit of early steam bent rings. They did that for a little while with like pine, super soft wood. And they, they eventually just started copying, um, uh, Tom, uh, or, or, uh, Rogers, Gretsch, and Camco, because these mm. were the drum sets that that had the respect. So later, MIJ start their main Japan stuff just gets better and better and better. Yeah, and Ludwig is still doing the same thing, and Gretsch is still doing the same thing, and everyone's still doing the same thing. But Japan is evolving and evolving and evolving, and. And then yeah. before you know it, you get to recording customs and, and uh, you know, uh, Tama Imperial Stars, Grand Stars and stuff. Well, and I just want to chime in and just say for people who are maybe watching or listening to this who don't know the whole history of, of, of Made in Japan or stencil drum sets, stencil referring to copying Rogers, Ludwig, Camco, and I mean, there's a whole bunch of little Easter egg kind of things that have popped up in, in previous episodes of the podcast where one person, like I think on the Slingerland episode with uh, Jim Moritz, he's like, oh yeah, my dad was giving uh, tours to Japanese businessmen and showing them the glue they used. And it's like, well, that probably led to the creation of like Tama or something like that. But anyway, these, so just again, to put it into perspective, those copycat brands, which were cheaper and used the poplar and softer woods, would have been Star. There's a thousand different names, yeah. but there'd be Pearl and Yamaha, which then led to the 80s Japanese brands, which is kind of what put an end to a lot of brands and, uh, yeah. you know, the, the heyday of those. So that's a brief uh, synopsis for people who maybe don't know that uh, background of the stencil stuff. Yeah, they would. The Japanese were actually making these things uh, super cheap, and what you could do is you could order them. Say you have a drum shop or a music store, you could order them with your badge and your company name on them. That's why yeah. there's a million names. Yeah, the Lyle yeah. and Stewart and Obsidian, and they just they go on and on. There's probably fifty of them. And they would they were making them cheap, and they were pretty much kind of disposable. You know, it was a great way to get your kid into drums. But they they started evolving so quickly. And I think the same thing actually happened in guitars with the Japanese guitars by the eighties were better than yeah. the American ones. And 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 what happened is, is those companies who were innovators and great success in the US in the sixties and seventies just kind of kept doing the same thing. They didn't, they, they didn't, to your question, they didn't really push 
the technology or make any major changes. Probably being bloated from the success of Ringo and the Beatles and the rock and roll revolution, they're like, we're going to, it's never going to end. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And then it's like, oh. wait, the Japanese have been on our, on our heels the whole time. Once they switched to hardwoods, legendary drum sets, legendary drum sets, because they were learning everything on these softer woods because it was cheaper and more affordable. And they were learning how to, uh, cast lugs and form hoops and, and they just got better and better and better. And by the eighties, as the amps got louder, people are using, you know, 150 watt tube amps and, you know, it just got so insane that, um, you couldn't bring a Ludwig. It, it wouldn't yeah. get through. You couldn't bring yeah. a, a vintage drum set of any kind. I mean, in the, in the nineties there, the, uh, vintage drum set or the Ludwig Slingerland market was like, you could buy those things for 300 bucks and nobody cared. A lot of them got spray painted and destroyed. And, um, because they just sure. couldn't compete with the times. Uh, Rogers was still in there. Rogers was killing it because of the hardwoods, Camco, Gretsch. Gretsch has always kind of been in there. And um, But once the Japanese, they just started doing amazing things. Um, if you scroll down, I think one or two more. Um, there you go. That is like 79, 78 uh, Tama. Really? Well, describe describe for people who are listening what we're looking at here the the, the construction and on all that and the, the edge and all that. This is a, a cutaway of a Tama. I think it's a, a Grand Star or Imperial Star. And what they did was the plies they used were twice the thickness of um, what most people were using in the drum shell world. And so they used less of them, but twice as thick. And then they literally copied the Remo head mold. Like if you went into Remo's factory and measured the mold that made the head, they put that into the end of the drum shell so that those two pieces just locked together. Wow. That makes so much sense. Now you'd think, <laughs> oh, why not? Yeah. But like, it's amazing no one else really thought about well, doing that. you know, Camco did that. Uh, I, okay. I, I'm I'm not sure for certain that they went there and and measured, but but with the Tama one, I actually know the story of that. These things project. I I often make the comparison when you're thinking about a drum shell. Think about it like a ride symbol. If it's thin, it's going to be warmer, and kind of more responsive to your touch it'll give you different sounds with with a different touch but a thick ride is either just quieter or louder depending on how you're only going to get one pretty much one sound out of that thick ride yeah and that's how these drum shells are as tama got thicker they just projected um not even not as dynamic or maybe as musical as a thin shell, somebody with who playing jazz or something more intricate, um, might not enjoy this kind of drum shell. But if you're getting through a half stack, this is the way to yeah. do it. Yeah, if you're in Metallica or Rush, depending on when, what the era of you know when you're playing, but like you, you just want to cut. I mean, yeah, makes perfect sense. Yeah, and that's and that's really what the hardwoods do. But I mean, you know, I did a Zydeco gig with a maple kit one time, and the bass player just kept looking at me during the gig, like, "Hey, dude, stop, go easy on the bass drum." <laughs> you know, there, there's just hmm. um, there's times you don't need that projection, and and that's where the softwood kits come in. Yeah, it does have to work for you. It just like. Of you instead of you playing softer, the drums are just designed uh, for that. So, this is vintage Tama uh, next to modern Tama. Left is vintage, right is modern. Correct? Yeah, and so what oh. happens is, is like 
sometimes when when folks are shopping drum shells and they're thinking about eight ply or six ply, it's kind of the overall thickness that matters the most. These are both the same ply count, but it, drastically different thickness. Because because it's the thickness, how thick they make the ply, how many sheets of that wood they use to compress and make it into one ply. Yeah, right? you can use uh, six or eight. You could use eight paper thin plies, or you could use eight thicker plies. But this, I'm sure that more modern one on the right is a hell of a lot lighter to carry around than uh, the one on the left, the the vintage one. It's lighter, it's cheaper to make and cheaper to ship, but if you're yep. looking for that quintessential Tama sound, um, it's it's got to be this, this shell, that Neil Pert kit that I just <laughs> trolled over for yeah. decades. Like that's this thing right here. Yeah. And, and it's a, uh, that really gave the cut, gave the projection and also shortened sustain a little bit. So when you hmm. talk about, or, or asked about major shifts, this is a major, this is a major shift. Pearl did the same thing. Um, Yamaha has always tended towards the thinner shell and that's why they have kind of more of an explosive thing because you can Yamaha's give you different sounds on how you hit them because you can in a sense overdrive the shell <laughs> that's cool um, where yeah. the, where this thicker Thomas shell you can't you can't overdrive that thing it'll take whatever you throw at it <laughs> yeah yeah uh, all right what do we have here next in our uh, series of photos oh this one's perfect this picture is showing those four different sections I mentioned. I see. Um, in here, you can see four horizontal lines through the drum shell, kind of under the silver paint. This would be a Jasper shell then, yeah, correct? Yeah, exactly. And this is to demonstrate how Jasper was using. And 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 this is a funny one to me. And, and it's not a slight because I own these drums and I think they're the greatest things ever. But the the whole silver sealer paint thing, the whole point of that is to hide these. <laughs> when the cus- they're like, D- don't look, don't look at that. <laughs> Seriously, I <laughs> look mean, look at the silver. <laughs> you you walk into a music store in the sixties or seventies, and you're going to pay the equivalent of a five or six thousand dollar drum set, and you see strips of wood on the inside. You're like, bro, what's that? Yeah, and and so. Um, Ludwig would do the same thing. Um, Rogers, who also used Jasper, um, would uh, they use gray paint? And then eventually, because you can still kind of see it through the paint, uh, eventually they did texture coat. <laughs> it's texture. Yeah, like the that old stuff you'd see in old rockers and stuff like that. That mm-hmm. like I forget what the the granitone, whatever it was, the sprayed. Uh, um, but like you'd think they could even like put like one final thin veneer kind of layer over top of it, but I guess that would affect the sound differently well, than. I think it it really wouldn't affect the sound. That's why I say these lines aren't a problem. Once you've got all of this wood with heat and glue and pressure, and you really have a composite, you have that that shell is one piece for yeah. the most part. So to me, those lines could be grain it wouldn't really matter but i think the situation was cost and availability of you know 16 inch wide uh perfect veneers and they and you know gretch and uh gretch and camco camco more so than anyone would would pay for that those supplies on the inner and on the outer full mm. sheet so if you find an unwrapped Rogers, Camco, or Gretsch, um, those were done with a more expensive shell where they put gotcha. full sheet on the inside and the outside. Well, I don't know if they did on the inside with the Gretsches because they had the paint, but they definitely put the full ply on the outside of like really high end models where they put finish on them as opposed to, to give wrap. it the f- polished look. I mean, Again, you are the master of all this stuff, and I'm kind of just, uh, I'm in no way an expert on on any of this, and I'm still learning a lot. But like, it's amazing the 
the glue holds and the construction holds both this, both vertically and horizontally to make this a sound round drum with no re-ring, correct? There's not a re-ring on there. That's amazing. I mean, it's, it's the, the real trick to it is the cross graining. So you have the first ply running east and west, the next ply north and south, next one east and west. So they are creating a yeah. lattice. And that structure is, is, um, comes from cross-graining. Sure. And I'm sure the seams this way don't line up down the drum to have one exactly Fold, folding point. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, they, they stagger the seam, and that allows you to get rid of the hump. And this is gotcha. another interior, although it's uh, these ones have vertical strips. Um, you might be able to see the there is vertical lines instead of horizontal lines every lug section or so, and these horizontal lines are where they just took strips of veneer and made a full sheet. And um, a lot of people don't know that that's why these things were painted. But I, I really, to me, structurally, this is. Zero problem. This is only a cosmetic issue. Hmm. So it's it's not to say that the drum isn't good because of that. Um, their their sound is their sound, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. The Jasper shells are fantastic. Yeah, they're legendary. Yeah. So then uh, the after Jasper, uh, Jasper started. I'm, I don't know why they didn't have more success, and maybe it was because um, by the 90s, you had a lot more uh, custom competition, custom drum builders because of Keller. Uh, Keller came around and kind of ate Jasper's lunch. I I don't know why that happened because I actually love Jasper shells, but um, Rod, the uh, Keller are fantastic too. Oh yeah, there's probably a reason that has nothing to do with quality or anything. Probably like a business reason or something that will. We'll find out later, I'm sure. (laughs) Yeah, that would be interesting. Have you done a a story on Keller yet? Keller, I have an episode with Justin Owens that was on... I mean, that was probably in the first 15 episodes. Oh, wow. So four or five years ago now. But uh, that's an interesting... It's a huge furniture. It's a huge company, massive company. And the drum shell portion of it is like pretty small but it's 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 small but mighty but compared to the um, uh, massive amount of other stuff they do it's a pretty small part of their business well it's it it's fascinating that they could have such a huge impact on music yes. and and culture and and it's not even their main thing no like furniture i remember watching the price is right reruns while ep- editing drum history at night, I'd have like on like, you know, you get free Pluto TV or mm-hmm. Samsung TV. There's like 24 hours of Baywatch or whatever channel. I had the prices right on and it would be like, you can win this beautiful uh, uh, chi- like like dining room set from Keller. And oh. it would be the same Keller who was making like dining room furniture. Wow. So, I never even thought about that because I feel like I've seen that as well. I grew up on yeah. when Price is Right. <laughs> Keller's been in your in your in the in your psyche for a long time without even knowing it. Yeah, they, and they were nice folks. Um, I started using Keller shells in like '98 or '99, um, and then uh, met them at uh, NAM, I think, 2006, hmm. and. Keller came in and they were using full sheets, uh, not necessarily on the inside, um, but they were using full sheets of ply 22 inches deep. You could buy Keller shells um, with just beautiful ply and um, really solid construction. I would say that the construction technique isn't really much different than Jasper. Um, They just they just went full force with it and really dove in and created sizes that Jasper wasn't doing. And, yeah. and I, I think that Jasper was kind of con contracted to not sell to the public. And I think that might've been what, what made Keller more successful was the thousands of people like me who started companies ordering Keller shells. 
I mean, it's like the the boutique drum brand revolution was like Keller shells, but it has to be, I would assume, because of the distribution channel of Keller being an already global wood yeah. conglomerate, whatever, like like corporation, they have they're buying so much of it, it's probably a much cheaper, you know, sourcing than than any other company. Yeah, and it was also their mindset because they sell parts. If if you're not looking at at Keller shells, you're looking at like um, uh, table bases and um, like they they'll sell you parts to build stuff out of oh, that's that are cool. are preformed ply. Like like if you go into a, a hotel lobby, uh, the construction underneath the the post is um, you know underneath you have a steel beam, but around that you have this beautiful wood column. That's a Keller shell around a steel beam. Um, you know, desk, uh, quarter rounds, half rounds. You can sure. buy all of these different parts from Keller. And so they had no problem just selling parts to makers. And I think, yeah. I think Jasper was more in the business of supplying these major drum companies. And Jasper yeah. continued on with Gretsch till kind of fairly recently there's no right or wrong way to do it obviously i mean it worked out for for the the players for many years but so the picture we're looking at here this is a keller correct this is this is a keller after well actually this is um this is dw uh current construction okay i see um and and the reason that kind of goes with the Camco photo is because Camco was the original, the Camco shell was the original DW shell. And so what they did was they keep kept this like vestige of a reinforcement ring. It's three plies, um, paper thin. Uh, it's glued on to the shell instead of, uh, hammered in, which is a completely different tonal characteristic. So this is like you were saying. This is this is really just a visual thing. Huh. It's 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 doing nothing as far as support of of the shell. Like the reason uh, companies like Camco and Rogers were successful by keeping the rings in, even though in the most part they're just kind of useless um is people were playing these drums at higher tension oh i see and so the ring starts to do something beautiful for the shell when you start to squeeze the shell if you're not squeezing the ring then it's not really doing anything it's just extra material the way that rings were originally done like in the camco sample and the Rogers sample, those were hammered in so that the the ring was pressing outward on the shell. The shell had a tension built into the sh- into it that was going this way, sw- yeah, pressing out. Okay, so that tension was opposite the inward tension of the drum head squeeze. So if you take a a drum and tune it you know, a tom and tune it up like a timbale, it's going to choke out. But if you have reinforcement rings in there, it's actually going to sing more as you tighten it. It's going to be more um, responsive and dynamic. They, Those huh. shells want to be under tension, but the later DW ring is really not tensioned. It's just added material. And so it's... It's good to know like why those things are there because really that's pretty much just for looks. I really like DW drums, but I'm sure that that strip though has some paragraph on the website about all the tonal qualities that it adds. Those things can make a difference. I mean, changing the direction of the grain and, and how many plies and all that stuff that it does have an effect on sound. Um, but it's, it's relatively minimal compared to how it's sold. Yeah. 
like it's it's the five or ten percent of what you're hearing and um it's the ninety percent that you should be worried about like the 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 full the full um you know hardwoods or softwoods you know I need a drum set that's loud and resonant is different than the tonal qualities of a birch versus a maple versus a babinga. They're all hardwoods. They're all going to be loud and resonant. They will all satisfy that person. Um, But it's the different tonal quality of each of those woods. That is more of the like selling factor is what you're saying of like, uh, I guess then it's more of a taste thing. And also you're, you're probably have a lot of money to work with at that point. If you've saved up, four grand for a custom kit in zebra wood or whatever, then you can have fun with that. But hardwood versus softwood is the key. Yeah. It's, it's like, do I need a sports car or do I need a truck? (laughs) Yeah. Then you can get into the subtleties of engines and exhaust systems. And, you know, it's, it's, um, it's really figuring out that, that main thing of like, do I need a loud kit that's resonant? still has warmth or do I need something that's mellow because people are telling me to be quieter and you know, my, yeah. the, the sound quality isn't fitting the style of the music. If Ringo's was playing a Yamaha maple custom, it, it wouldn't sound like Reem, Ringo and it wouldn't sound like the Beatles It'd be too resonant and sustaining and washy. And, well, that's why we should all own multiple drum sets and have a dozen snare drums <laughs> and get some get some Kirsch drums up in there and uh, one uh, one hardwood kit and one softwood kit, which goes back to the MIJs. Like they're ultimately like by the two thousands to today, those softwood kits are still those softwood kits. They're they're yeah. they're almost no different. They are manufactured tighter and at higher standards than the original MIJs, but, um, it's still the same sound. It's still, you know, if you want a vintage sound, uh, and you're on a budget, buy a $300 kit and get your edges rounded over like a Ludwig. And, and you'll get all of that character of a warm, thumpy, um, Ludwig without necessarily having to take out your classic, you know, kit that's now worth a lot of money. Yeah. 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 That's a very good point. So pretty much any hardwood kit can do the job of the hardwood kit, you know, before the subtleties, like, you know, um, an all maple PDP honestly is like when you get edges put on it (laughs) is, is one of the greatest maple kits that you can buy and they're fully affordable and they'll do everything that a $5,000 maple kit will do. Yeah. Are there maybe some little subtleties that you'll hear eventually after playing for 20 years? Yeah, you'll get those subtleties, but most people don't need them, I I think. Yeah, because you're out there playing it and you've saved three grand on that kit. Um, That's a good tip. So, Jeff, we also have a batch of photos that you have sent me that are uh, Japanese drums, which we talked about a little bit before, but let's dive deeper now into the amazing Japanese drums. Yeah. So once they sort of got moving and uh, started selling a lot of stuff, they were again, selling uh, entry level drum sets, um, soft woods, thin lugs, things broke, whatever. They learned from all of these lessons and kept evolving and adapting and making things stronger and better. And then you get to the mid mid to late seventies. And by this point, they're making drum shells out of all maple, all birch. Most of the Japanese drums are pressed using a bladder system that, um, that makes just flawless drum shells. And, um, you know, no dead spots and uh, dry spots where the shells can come apart. Really, really resonant and really, really loud. And they got super popular because, you know, like you said, if you're going to be in Slayer, you need <laughs> you need something that's going to get through. 
Yeah. And and so by the late seventies and early eighties, you know, this is this is kind of what Neil Pert was playing, this kit right here. And sure. there's a special thing that happens in the mid uh, to late seventies and early eighties where Tama and Yamaha were both finishing the bearing edges. And what they would do is they would sand the entire shell, form the bearing edge, hand sand and polish the bearing edges, and then put finish over everything. You know, I'm staring at this picture and I don't, I, I'm just thinking, man, that looks so good. But I don't think I just, it occurred to me that the bearing edge is finished like that compared to the previous drums, which are just unfinished. That looks so great like that, that extra little bit of detail. Oh, it's beautiful. And and I can tell you from experience, it is a nightmare to do because <laughs> yeah. you have to, this is a blonde wood and you have to sand this finish and smooth this finish without going through the red and into the blonde. Oh boy. Oh, it's such a pain. Ugh, because then you're you can't really send it back to the paint department and it's just they did not do this for very long and i guarantee you it was the finishers who put a stop to it yeah, uh, they're like okay okay no more <laughs> no more polishing finish on bearing edges this is a nightmare this, and and so it was a very short period of time it was maybe 78 to 84 i think is the latest i've ever seen a painted edge kit and that's hmm. what some of us nerds call them. Um, this is Neil Pert, Tama, uh, bearing edge and uh, shell configuration. The, the, his his cherry kit was was like this. And then this one here, you can also see the bearing edges are painted the same color as the interior. That looks beautiful with with a yellow wrap around the outside. And this had a beautiful quality where um, a very warm, easy to tune sound because the bearing edges weren't just cut by the machine. They were cut, then they were polished, hand sanded, which rounded them a little bit more and smoothed them a little bit more. And then they were clear coated and then that was sanded and smoothed and polished a little bit more. And so what you end up with is sort of like a miniature Ludwig edge, the big fat round edge, but in in miniature. And, and does it, the, does all that polish and finish and all this stuff on the actual edge itself does that sonically affect it to brighten things, or what do you think? Um, I think it's more the shape. If if anything, oh, it, sure. it, it would probably darken things um, because then you have a uh, the finish is a little bit softer than the wood, so it would sort of, again, that zero ring effect of gotcha. the material. It, but um, it's it's a very hard finish, and I th I think really more than anything, it's the shape that is um, that's making the the tuning really really easy. And it's funny the history of the recording custom wasn't like okay, let's. Um, Let's make a drum set for studios. They just started producing this 9000 kit with these rounded, painted, finished edges. And um, studios and recording drummers, Gad and you know all those cats, they love these kits so much that they renamed them Recording Custom. And because it was so popular in the studio, it's like, well, let's call it the recording custom. It yeah. Makes sense. Early on, they were 9,000s. Yeah. And it's kind of funny because it's not a lot of gear that actually earns its name. And and they sh they shined in the studio because you could be an engineer who doesn't know drums and you could pretty much tune them. And then um, that rounded hand drum kind of edge focused the sound and shortened the decay made them really really popular in the studio and mm. and that's that's kind of where the name came from uh the original 9000s didn't even have that lug yet that longer lug came around a little bit after that okay which has became truly did become I iconic steve gad everyone thinks the recording customs and the, the sound of a, a generation 
Yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting because the origin of the edge was from the uh, marching drum department. The story that I heard was that, um, you know, with marching drums, you can't have a razor sharp edge on with all that tension and everything. Um, so the, the edges on the marching drums were really kind of a fat rounded over hand drum kind of edge. And, um, and Sakai, the designer was walking past them, uh, loosely fitting heads on to put them in package on marching drums. Hmm. And he, he heard that warm resonant tone that also decayed really quickly and, and took the marching drum edge and said, let's try it on this model of kit. Wow. And and so that, that was a, you know, that separated from the rest of the Yamaha lineup that had started to do the more modern, uh, almost single cut kind of bearing edges. You know, Yamaha is fascinating in that regard, kind of similar to Keller, but, but different, but where like, uh, Jim Haler early on in the podcast did a Yamaha episode, but oh, where it nice. was like, it's such, it's like, I remember him saying that they would borrow ideas from like the motorcycle department mm-hmm. for the Chrome, or they would take the piano finish, you know, black and put that on the drums. It's like most companies don't have the luxury of being like, let's go over to the, uh, speedboat department. <laughs> and like, look at what they're doing. It's, it's, there's such a big, you know, multi faceted company. It's interesting to that. They can pull that. Obviously the marching drum is in the same world, oh, but, yeah. but they have so many categories, you know, uh, they, they had so much going on. Like their Chrome plating is amazing. You will see stuff pitting from other brands from the eighties and your Yamaha's they're not going to be pitting unless sure. they were really treated poorly. Like every every aspect of them, the way that they place lugs on their higher end models today, the um, the uh, nouveau lugs, they're floating in a specific spot. The lug is actually placed to match how uh, marimbas and vibraphones are built, and hmm. you know that Yamaha builds those, and so they understood the physics of. Uh, where they put the cables through the marimba key determines whether or not um, that key can resonate. There's actually precise points called nodes, and the cables need to go through these nodes. Um, any any physical object that's vibrating and making a sound has a wave going through it, and there are two flat spots where that wave isn't vibrating. So if you run your mounting, whether it's lugs or cables on a vibraphone, uh, if you run your mounting where the part isn't vibrating, you can't interrupt the vibration, and it'll huh. behave as though it's not mounted at all. Interesting. And, I, and, I know I've been told that before in some capacity <laughs> on some episode, and I just sat there and went, right. Uh-huh, yeah. But now hear, hearing it again, I'm like, right. I think I hear that. I understand it a little bit more. Yeah, I kind of wish I had something around I could demonstrate it with, but no, I it makes sense though that there's those two use those two nodes where there's no vibrations. Use those to put your heavy hardware and your your things that shouldn't be vibrating to maximize the the resonance. Yeah, because it's the the wave starts and then it goes down to two to one flat point, out again, back down to another flat point, and then out again. Whether it's a metal pipe, a drum shell, a marimba key. Uh, vibraphone key, it's gonna it's gonna wave like that. And if you put your parts, and as the tube or material gets longer, the wave gets longer. So, so you have more room to put a lug or whatever. Well, the location of the node moves. Oh, I see. I it, see. I see. It moves down, and and so you can look at like a the nouveau lugs or any any of their higher end ones yamahas and you'll see that the floor tom lug is actually farther away from the bearing edge than the rack tom lug which is really close to the bearing edge cuz they're using the nodes to allow the shell to resonate more by taking the lug and putting it in that flat spot just wow. completely nerdy stuff and and like you said they get they get that from yeah. being in other industries 
Sure. But that's like, that's why you pay for this stuff. And that's why that is really answering the question of like, why do drum brands sound so different when it comes down to it? I mean, really, that's now we're getting into like the why Japanese brands are so great is they add that next level. But honestly, too, that that makes American brands kind of step their game up. I'm oh, sure they did. They yes. did. Like modern Ludwig and Gretsch, good stuff. Like they they did. You know, it took yeah. them a little while, and I think that that might have almost gone out of business a few times there. But um, and I think who who actually pushed them after that was the custom, the custom of course market. You know, in the '90s, but in the '80s. Um, they were just, I feel like they were asleep at the wheel. You know, Ludwig did get rid of the reinforcement rings and started using a thicker combination of uh, Luan and Maple and to varying degrees of success because they they still didn't bring their diameter down, which was always a problem on Ludwig's is being a little over diameter. Uh, Gretsch mm. brought their diameter down in, in, in the 60s. Um, early seventies, like, and eventually, um, Gretsch was using Keller, um, and Jasper, if I remember correctly, they used Jasper for a long time and eventually went to Keller. And I don't, I don't know this, but I'm guessing after working on some modern Gretsches that, um, Nordic is probably making Gretsch's shells now, but I'm not. I'm just guessing American Gretsch. Yeah. Interesting. Which another thing I should do an episode on is Nordic shells, uh, which has been suggested multiple times. Yeah. Um, I need to do more company histories uh, coming up to get back to my, back to my roots. But yeah. And, and they're all interesting of like you say, Oh, it's Keller shells, but it's been said many times on the show that it's a special formula for those big brands of like combinations. They, they have, they're not just an off the shelf Keller shell. Usually, it's like a specific thing for those brands, as far as I understand. Yeah, yeah. Most of the time, like, you know, when I first started, I could order Keller shells in five or six different thicknesses and, um, you know, uh, different woods. And But I, I think that Nordic is, is probably just... I mean, if if Keller is just a small part, if the drum shells are just a small part of the com- company, I don't, I wouldn't be surprised if if Keller ends up like Jasper, you know, because um, Nordic is really those folks are fantastic and they are just evolving the drum shell so quickly. Like what's available to to builders or even to you, you can order shells from them with you know bearing edges cut and. Hmm. Um, you know, they've got like 15 different woods and all these different configurations you can really get in. But uh, I always try to bring folks kind of back down a little bit on the on the wood on the wood choices. Just know if you need a hardwood kit or a softwood kit and um, like don't pay a thousand dollars more for a couple of plies of Babinga or or zebra or whatever unless you, you got the money to spend. You're spending that money for style. Yeah, because if you put two plies of zebra wood on a maple shell, guess what? You have a really expensive maple shell. It's still going to sound like a maple shell. It's now if you build it completely out of zebra wood, which Nordic can do. Um, that's a whole nother story. You know, yeah. Like, but as you and I both know, Jeff, style is the most important thing in life, and <laughs> nothing else comes even close to that. So I get it. Uh, oh, especially <laughs> nowadays. You know, I didn't know what any of my favorite drummers looked like. I didn't know what gear they had. I just knew if their music moved me or not, you know? Yes. Now we know what they ate for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and uh, <laughs> what they're doing all the time. Oh, Lord, um, their political views. Oh, no. And political views. All right. Well, Jeff, let's let's bring it on home here and look at these last couple and then uh, we'll close things out. So, yeah, the, this this edge uh, is on Tama and Yamaha from mid 70s to about 84. And both of them stopped. Um, after that, um, you have these blonde edges. And what that is, is 
single cut edge all the way to the outside ply with a little bit of hand sanding on the outside ply. It's a completely different structure, completely different tone, completely different tuning. And and so I I like to to tell folks about this, you know, watch for those painted edge uh recording customs. Um that is the real the real deal recording custom sound. And mm, that's good to know. That's a that's a some a tip you can use if you're out on the marketplace looking for them. I mean, so that's the secret sauce is the painted edge. What we looked at before Thomas as well. Yeah. Um, Cause that first yeah. shot is the Neil Pert Tama. Um, yeah. That era is just, that's the eighties drum sound. It It's fat and loud, but also a little bit gated uh, just flawless. And as soon as you get into modern, well, actually 1984, 85, that edge is, is gone. And all you're yeah. seeing after that is uh, this single cut, which honestly, I could put a 12 year old on a router and have him doing single cut 40s, 45s, like all day long. And um, mm. the, maybe and you, you should that would you'd be producing drums a lot quicker uh, <laughs> oh my lord if if i could do <laughs> the stuff that other companies do i'd i'd probably actually be making money <laughs> but but no, i just, don't change who you are no yeah. i it's, i just i love how every brand had this moment where they just hit absolute perfection of like design and and i want to i want to compile those moments into drums and and um and like for example taking taking modern recording customs and putting the vintage recording custom edge oh it's beautiful and and like kind of making things finding the peaks of quality of each brand and then trying to slam them all together in one one drum set that'd be awesome because i mean i'm sure what happens then is is like they're like all right these are amazing. They're perfect. And then someone comes in and goes, they're too expensive. We got to make them cheaper. Yes. Yeah. And that's and where it faster can be me even more important than cheaper. Okay. Sure. Cause if you've got a contract with guitar center and you've got to get, you got to get them 25,000 kits this year. And as far as they're concerned, those kits are already sold. And if you're not oh. delivering, you're costing them money and, they'll take your company eventually if, if you don't deliver. And so there, there's kind of a um, speed is a really big issue. Um, that was one of the things with changing uh, finished products that could dry faster. You know, this, this gotcha. edge on screen, that one there, that's both of those are, are single cut. So that is one process. That takes half the time of yeah. inside and outside. Now you've got only inside and you've removed a tool and an employee from the process. You've removed a step and those steps can either be to make more money or, or really speed is usually the thing. Like as a, a custom builder, we, we all get yelled at for our speed um, because we're focusing on minute details to get, you know, a perfect product. And if you're going to be in a mass market, you got to get these things out. And, and I think that yeah. was really the reason and the finishers yelling about having to polish bearing edges with a, <laughs> not hit the blonde. Yeah. They're like, this is, this is too much where, but like you're saying with, with a guy like you, it's like, Hey, why does my drum set take eight to 12 weeks or whatever? It's like, well, you're doing it by hand and you've got a, and I don't know your timeline. I'm, I'm completely guessing against everyone's eight to 12 of, months sometimes. <laughs> well, I mean, it's cause you're getting, you're getting uh, one man doing it all and you have the perfection and well, uh, you and, haven't gotten and your, the, there's yeah. some projects where um, one guy is making the lugs. Another guy is making a hoops. Another guy is making throw offs and mounting brackets and another person's you know like i've i've had customers before where they want to go to like the king of artisan made throw offs and then they want to go to the guy who's doing the you know beautiful acacia wood hoops and and so i'm i'm 
working with a lot of other folks too. Sure. Have deadlines. With their timelines. Yeah. Um, all right. So we got one more picture here we're looking at. Interestingly, um, you know, they re-released the recording customs a few years back. Sure. And they actually worked with Gad on them. And he's like, hey, you got to round over that bearing edge. And so the new recording customs have kind of more of the... Interesting. Of that uh, original recording custom edge. It's not... I don't believe it's finished, but it is a similar shape and brings back that sound. So it was... It was interesting for me because I've always been a fan of that kit and of Gad, and for him to, to come back to Yamaha and be like, let's make it exactly like the old one. <laughs> yeah, let's do that exact same thing again. I mean, that, that, makes sense. that bearing edge changed my world like as a drummer and then led me to becoming a builder because yeah. I struggled with a modern drum kit that I had, and I didn't know why I was struggling, and I traded it for a recording custom. And all of those struggles were gone. And the guy was like, yeah, it's just this old 70s Japanese drum set, whatever. And I'm like, oh, my God, this thing is like rays of light from the heavens. And (laughs) why? What is different? Why does this brand sound different than that brand? And, you know, I took the head off and I saw polished, finished, round, just matching the shape of the drum head. You know, it didn't rock or wobble or just bloop. yeah and i finger tighten tension rods and i've got my first note i'm not even using a drum key and i've got my first note and it's like okay what is going on here and so i ended up cutting that edge for i was doing cabinetry and, and woodworking and i ended up cutting copying that bearing edge onto my cheap kit that i started with uh tom a rock star and that kit took off Sounded beautiful, easy to tune. <laughs> Stayed in tune for weeks, and then, um, and then a friend said, "Hey, could you do that with mine?" And then another friend, and then another friend. And wow! Before I knew it, it was my job, and and it it all came from buying that painted edge recording custom. <laughs> That's amazing, man. Yeah, I mean, but it's it's true. It's it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be hard. It is not supposed to be hard to tune things, but sometimes what you get, even from the store, like that leads me to, again, direct people to check out your uh, episode, which is 117 from 2021, A Look at Bearing Edges uh, with Jeff Kirsch. It was a really cool episode that talked more about that and the importance of it. Yeah, I, I really, yeah. I, I rant about the fact that if you if you bought a guitar, brand new, Fender America, Gibson USA and pull that out of the box and try to use it in the recording studio. You're probably not going to be able to do it. It's going to need intonation set. It's going to need the string height set. They do as much as they can for a mass producer who has to get out, you know, 150,000 of them or whatever. Um, But guitar players know that guitar players that I've ever, nearly everyone I've ever worked with, like, Oh, I can't tune this. And then the next week they bring it back. They're like, yeah, I took it to my tech. It's amazing now. And and that made me jealous. Like, why don't I have a tech? Why am I buying duct tape and gels and, you know, spending three hours going, doom, 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 trying to. <laughs> yeah, to perfect like, why, it. Why does this have to be so hard when my buddy just pays a tech a hundred bucks or 150 bucks and he's got a fully reliable instrument that tunes easy and stays tuned. And so that I, I, I just, um, I guess the point of that is factories really don't do those details and don't, don't count on your factory to do it. No, but uh, you and you go into a lot of detail about that. I recommend people. I'll put the link in the description for that other episode, which is a really cool one. Pre-video. Uh, that's way back when it was just audio. Um, so you can check it out on the podcast platforms. Uh, or if you're on YouTube, it's just a still image or something. It's up there. But um, Jeff, for the sake of time, for keeping this under <laughs> yeah. like a two-hour episode, let's, um, <laughs> let's wrap up there. But I want to tell people to check out Kirsch Drums, K-I-R-S-C-H drums.com 
I mean, you're a master builder. You're very, you have a great reputation amongst everyone. Um, oh, or Kirsch Drums Portland. Uh, you can search that and he'll show up as the drum nerd on their um, Instagram. On Instagram, yes, on Instagram. And uh, I'm really happy to have you on again and just have you as a friend and, and a trusted, uh, you know, you're an expert in the field. So, man, I really, really appreciate your time. Well, thank you for having me on. I, I, I really appreciate it. I get a kick out of your show. I learn a lot from it. And and I, I keep learning. And, and that's I, cool. I think that's where the, the, you know, like talking about the Japanese making killer drums, they kept learning. And yeah. Everyone else, keep learning. Keep learning. That's uh, absolutely right. It means a lot to me that you learn from. I mean, you're you're learning more from the guests that I have on, which I fully understand that. Oh, but I'm glad I can love uh, it. I love it. I can I can get all these people like you in one place for people who are like experts to learn from other experts, and I'm learning along with you, and I think it's awesome. So, um, well, just don't get yes. us all together in the same room at the same time because. <laughs> <laughs> too many experts. We'll be too throwing punches room. about what bearing edge is the best one to use, or or if they even matter at all. That, that's my favorite yes. one. Bearing edges don't matter. And that's the yeah. And there's famously a person who will say that bearing edges don't matter. Yet that guy makes the best bearing edges of any large production drums on the planet. <laughs> so there's a kind of a beautiful irony Ironic. there. But yes. I'll leave you to guess who that is, but. Yes. Yes. Cliffhanger for people to figure that one out. <laughs> anyway. All right, Jeff. Well, thanks, man. And I appreciate your time. And, and we'll have to have you back on for another episode down the line because you're a, uh, a definite, you know, person. I, I, I really love your opinion and, and the stuff that you bring to the show. So uh, thank you, Jeff, for being here. Oh, thank you so much. Talk to you soon. 